The 60s were an incredible decade. From civil rights to the sexual revolution, people were rising up and shifting the cultural landscape. And it's during this time that a man with an extraordinary eye for photography began Cult Studios and introduced us to a new way of looking at the male physique. Jim French began Cult Studios in the late 1960s, beginning the most successful empire of male nude imagery since Bob Miser's Athletic Model Guild. The gay community had just torn its way out of the Stonewall Inn and into the public eye. The U.S. Post Office had just lifted its ban on male frontal nudes passing through the mail system. Under the pseudonym Rip Cult, French created a sleek visual language for worshipping the male body. Cult Studio launched as an erotic physique photography catalog that would mail folios of images to customers on their mailing list. Although there were other companies doing the same, Jim French, the founder of Cult, also known as Rib Cult, soon perfected his technique and stood out on his own. Cult Studio would go on to become an icon of gay erotica. Although Cult was not initially a gay porn film company, they are technically the oldest gay porn studio in the United States, having started as a mail order photography company and moving on to gay porn video in the early 1980s. If you ever bought a Cult Studio magazine or were lucky enough to get your hands on one of their early film loops, you would have come across a model by the name of Dakota. Tall, blonde, and a beautiful body, Dakota quickly became one of the superstars Cult can count on because of his popularity. But Dakota was an alter ego. His real name was Ken Sprague, and he was a big fucking deal in the formative years of bodybuilding as a sport. From owning the original Gold Gym to palling around with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ken Sprague was no regular porn star. On tonight's episode, the first of season four of Demystifying Gay Porn, we're going to recognize Jim French, the man behind the camera better known in the adult entertainment world as Rip Colt. Colt Studio at his original conception and an iconic collection of cult films directed by the maestro himself. And Dakota, a.k.a. Ken Sprague, one of Colt Studio's most popular models who started his career modeling and escorting, then purchasing the original Gold Gym and molding it into a household name. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Jim French was about to become a man who was ready to blow the lid off the repressive roof that covered American culture for so long. And he did so at a time when publishing and distributing explicit material would result in harassment and jail sentences. Born in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania in July 1932, James Thomas French was an American artist, photographer, illustrator, filmmaker, and publisher. He is best known for his association with Cult Studio, one of the most successful gay male erotica companies in the United States. French began his career after graduating from the Philadelphia Museum School of Art as a commercial artist primarily based in fashion illustration. In 1953, the year before his graduation from the museum school, he joined the United States Army Reserves and went on active duty in 1955. French earned an honorable discharge from the service in 1957. Settled in New York City, he pursued a successful freelance career as an advertising illustrator for several Madison Avenue advertising firms. During this time, one of his main clients was Columbia Records, where he produced portraits of stars like Johnny Cash, Frank Sinatra, Johnny Mathis, and Barbara Streisand. French also worked freelance in New York City, having an office on Madison Avenue and working for BBDO, Young and Rubicon, and other high-end advertising agencies drawing everything from storyboards for commercials to comps for ads. After that, French got an agent and started doing fashion drawings for Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf during the lucrative Mad Men era of New York City advertising. French drew homoerotic drawings in his spare time under the pseudonym of Arian. His drawings were offered in 1966 through Ed Wilde's Times Square Studio, as well as his own short-lived mail-order venture, The Aryan Studio. French was approached by a friend from his army days, Sal Stolman. Stolman had seen some of his Aryan drawings and wanted to create a physique studio in New York City. Over dinner one day, Stolman suggested to French that he draw bodybuilders for reproduction and sale. French adopted a new pseudonym for this venture, Kurt Luger, and under the name Luger Studios began producing more masculine-figured illustrations, which featured leathermen, cowboys, wrestlers, and other similar archetypes. French kept his day job, but began this new venture with a set of six drawings. They placed a few ads in Weeder Publications, a magazine published by Joe Weeder, 
and the response was spectacular. The drawings were not full frontal, but they were sexy. Luger Studio artwork first appeared as two drawings from the Cowboy series in the May-June 1966 issue of Young Physique. This series of six to eight drawings was advertised in other male erotica magazines and was available for purchase through mail order. The success of Luger Studio developed quickly after being featured in the pages and on the covers of a wide assortment of physique magazines. Saul Stoneman bought French's interest in the studio in February of 1968 and briefly ran the business on his own. However, now featuring photographs and 8mm films from substandard producers, Luger Studio did not attract enough interest to survive beyond 1968. It was around that time that French met Lou Thomas and started Cult Studios in 1967. Cult? Luger? Are we seeing a pattern here? On December 5th of 1967, Jim French and Lou Thomas, a friend and astute businessman, took out a business license to form Cult Studio. Although originally named to evoke the image of a cult pistol, the studio quickly changed its cult image to that of a stallion. Now, there were photographers way before Jim French, and even photographers specializing in the male physique, as we will examine later on in the season. But Jim French's style featured hyper-masculine soldiers, cowboys, and bikers. French may have been the first finely trained artist to work in photography with male nudes. In 1967, Jim French began to use the name Rip Cult and he produced highly detailed drawings for books, magazines, and calendars. French and Thomas began doing this when there were still laws banning homosexuality in many states. During this time, they used small, independent printing presses and reproduction studios, whose activities were regularly targeted by authorities for obscenity laws. When the Polaroid camera came on the scene, Jim French jumped at the technology. Not having to rely on processing the images, he started portraying male models for research studies and their edginess built a new market. Exuding with countercultural cool that influences Robert Maplethorpe, Herb Ritz, and Bruce Weber. French was in Florida when the Polaroid was invented and introduced. In order to make his vision more believable, French looked to Polaroids for the answer. Before the camera's advent, it had been a challenge getting erotic subject matter that was shot on film processed as many venues were reluctant to deal with the material. The Polaroid camera, which contained its own processor, solved that issue with its instant results. In the initial years of the company, Cult Studio released French's illustrations under the Rip Cult name and photo sets of masculine male models. The studio eventually added short films, magazines, and calendars. The studio was based in New York City for six years, and then in 1974 relocated to Studio City in California due to French's frequent travels. It was around that time that French realized he didn't really need a business partner. He needed a business manager. Thomas and French remained business partners until eventually it became a toxic work environment. French bought the company shares, owned by Lou Thomas, who soon formed his own business, Target Studios, a venture which provided the underground demographic with quality homoerotic art and film. Cult Studio grew into one of the most successful gay photography studios of its time and offered the highest quality male erotica commercially available. Jim French's company was famous not only for its stable of male models, but also for its magazine brands which included Spurs, Cult Men, Manpower, and its film venue, Cult Studio Presents. French ran the company until 2003, when he sold the studio to former Falcon Studios director John Rutherford and his partner Tom Settle. Jim worked very hard to build his brand and a business, but feels he sold at the right time. With the rate of piracy in the world becoming so prevalent, Jim sold Cult Studios in 2003 and started a business in fine arts. He attributes the internet from saving him from going too far. For a few years after the sale of Cult Studio, Jim French continued to privately sell salon-style prints of his photographs before he settled into quiet retirement. French's photographs and illustrations can be found in many private and public collections. Jim French passed away peacefully in his sleep at his Palm Springs, California home on June 15, 2017. Jim French's pioneering work in modern masculine male nude photography helped countless young and closeted gay men have a place and provide role models. He helped create images of men that are still popular today. According to Jim French, his timing was just right. He began working on his nudes after the sexual revolution had exploded into the zeitgeist, allowing artists of all mediums to revel in their sexual expression. 
today, French's images have become icons of a singular moment in gay history. Post Stonewall and pre-AIDS. Post Beefcake and pre-VHS. These days, new concepts of what makes a man and gender fluidity represent a freedom away from the classic construction of the butch man. Nevertheless, Jim French influenced the ideals of male beauty forever with astonishing skill and an eye for the subtle erotic. But Cult Studio was born of an era of fantasy. It's men existing only in French's photographs. There is a tradition of these communication gaps between gay men. The narrative always broken into disparate eras with disparate priorities. Fun fact, a sex shop in London hung a t-shirt made by designer Malcolm McLaren that reproduced an image of Jim French's called Longhorns. It was later worn by Sid Vicious, the lead singer of the Sex Pistols. Jim had no idea that his image was being used and never received royalties for his art. However, it is a testament of how far his work had infiltrated and inspired mainstream culture. At the time Jim French started his photography, you could still be arrested under the U.S. obscenity laws. Many photographers at the time struggled with the fine line of what is pornography and what is fine art. After starting Luger and selling his share of that company, Jim French launched a new studio and picked Colt as its name. The original logo was a pistol, but later was changed when the brand became Colt Studio. Jim French adopted the name Rip Colt in an attempt to personalize the brand and the rest is history. French said goodbye to fashion illustration once Colt Studio gave him financial stability. Colt rags, rag being a slag term for magazines, were now available wherever magazine and adult products were sold. Jim's weapon of choice, a Hasselblad camera. A fine camera with glass that can capture the smallest detail and that were used during the NASA missions and the moon landings during the 1960s. Later on in his career, he began using Polaroids for stage setting, those images themselves also becoming iconic. French had a habit of developing a good, long-lasting relationship with his models, to the point where the models would refer friends, and this is a major way he recruited. This gave Cult an edge with the models they worked with. Many chose to work only with Cult, as it was seen as such an exclusive opportunity. French's casting process was as easy as looking at a model and seeing if there was something about him that he would want to capture on film. Whatever that may have been is in the eye of the beholder. French transitioned into movies when he was given a Niso Super 8 camera. While French enjoyed films, he was not convinced the fantasy of an image could be produced in moving image. Although he never recorded sound for his films, music was a very important part of his films. Rip continued to shoot his highly stylized and highly masculine scenes for Cult well into the 2000s, often consisting of solos. Rip Cult finally threw in the towel and sold Cult Studio to former Falcon Studios director John Rutherford and his partner Tom Settle. John Rutherford was quoted in 2003 saying, The quest of the company remains the same as it was from the beginning, to present the most outstanding examples of masculinity to be found. To do it with the best photography, videography, and reproduction possible and to service our very special mail order and online customers with efficiency and honesty. Tough goals we're constantly striving to maintain, and we've been doing it successfully for a long time. Here's to what was, what is, and what is to be. One word says it all. Cult. Cult Studio's success had such an influence that to celebrate its 40th anniversary in 2007, then San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom declared February 23rd Cult Studio Day. Text of Mayor Newsom's proclamation honoring Cult Studio, a gay porn production company, reads, Whereas San Francisco recognizes individual achievements of its diverse communities, celebrate their contributions to the city, and appreciates the rich legacies of ingenuity, creativity, and innovation, and whereas Cult Studios has produced movies that have entertained the gay community over the past 40 years, and whereas Cult Studios has brought hundreds of millions of dollars in business to the city and county of San Francisco, contributing to the city's robust economy, and whereas Cult Studio has created many jobs within San Francisco's boundaries, stimulating the job market and the local economy in general, now therefore it be resolved that I, Gavin Newsom, mayor of the city and county of San Francisco, congratulate Cult Studios on the occasion of their 40th anniversary 
and proclaim February 23rd, 2007 as Cult Studio Day in San Francisco. After being attacked by conservative media, however, it was reported the mayor had a change of heart and would change its policy on issuing laudatory proclamations after the gay porn studio was honored. Cult Studio Group, which still operates today, is one of the biggest names in porn in the U.S. While they don't seem to release porn videos any longer, their extensive catalog is readily available on their website for anyone to explore. Whether they still produce or not, their lasting impact in shaping the gay adult entertainment world has had a lasting effect. If you've watched the previous episode on Jim French, you'll know he only started using a film camera after a Niso Super 8 was gifted to him. His early films were called Loops. Porn Loop is a slang term for the pornographic film loops created with Super 8 millimeter film starting in the late 1960s through the 1980s. Most porn loops went by many names, Stag Film, Blue Movie, Smoker. However you may have heard it before, during the mid-20th century, they were produced secretly. The porn loops were mostly silent, and they depicted explicit or graphic sexual behavior intended for men and screened for an all-male audience. Yes, gay porn loops were shown to this audience as well until they eventually were deemed not popular for fraternities, parties, and similar locations. But that's a whole other episode. Loops were largely replaced or phased out by technological improvements to both filmmaking and distribution, including the home movie industry when anyone can purchase a movie to view in private. Rip Colt's sex-rated home videos reads as such. Porn loops that were compiled into this collection of three films. The films are filled with beautiful men, hard dicks, tan lines. The men smile and have a good time as Colt captures them in various different positions from silly to sexy. Also, most of the men were called superstars in their day. Any early viewer of porn could pick them out of a lineup. At first glance, it's easy to see that this isn't the hardcore adult entertainment you see saturated in the market today. The tropes were not fully established cinematically. In a way, this collection feels like an artist experimenting with a film camera and recording things that he likes. And if you happen to like it as well, well then good. In some of the sex scenes, the heads are cut out of frame, as if only placing an importance on what viewers wouldn't see every day. The solo scenes are almost like photographs. The models are strategically placed with minimal movement at times, which feels like an establishing shot. Scenes are minimally cut to focus on the action at hand. For instance, one scene features a model slowly sucking a dildo. Aside from a couple of slow zoom-ins, this is what the audience is made to pay attention to. When clothes are worn, they are worn to perfection. Be it a biker, the repairman, the cowboy, the bad boy. Yep, they're all in there. In many of the scenes, there is witty and cheeky banter written on title cards like a movie from the silent era. And with good reason. Rip Cole did not record audio while shooting his scenes and preferred to have music provide the background. In some instances, you hear sound effects, but they would have been added in during post. Watching the newer cuts put together by Cult Studio Group leads me to believe the music may have been changed from its original soundtrack. As for the storyline, well... There isn't really a storyline developed more than you can imagine. From the way it's shot, you can tell Rip is trying to capture the same magic that he did in his images. And while the men are beautiful, and some of the shots are great, it's very tricky for even the most seasoned photographers. Overall, I think it's exciting to watch this from a different perspective. For a consumer of porn, you'd have to be into solos, body worship, and documentary-style feel. The shots in most of the scenes are beautifully nostalgic, but watching it, I can only imagine watching this for the first time when it was released and being filled with so many emotions. It's interesting, and in my opinion, important to see where much of what we view today started and what was sexy. Minimalism. Kent Sprague was born on July 14, 1945 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Growing up comfortably, Sprague's family were cultured in art, politics, and athletics. His mother was a ballet dancer, his father a contractor. Since childhood, Sprague was led to develop passion for sports. His older brother competed in gymnastics, track, and Olympic weightlifting. In 1962, Sprague began attending Robert A. Taft Information Technology High School, a predominantly black high school, mostly because of their athletic teams. While a member of the high school football team, Sprague met his future wife, Melrose Thrower. 
When Sprague's coach found out he was dating an African-American girl, he was told to not see her again. When Sprague refused, he was suspended. He was also met with disapproval from his parents about his relationship with Thrower. When his girlfriend found out she was pregnant, Sprague found a job and sued his parents for guardianship so he can marry Thrower. The couple married in June 1964, and their son Kenneth Sprague Jr. was born two months later. Their daughter Julie was born in 1966. When Sprague was 18, he was encouraged by a National Olympic weightlifting coach to try the sport out. Sprague competed for the next five years, winning numerous AAU championships and receiving the Mr. Cincinnati bodybuilding title in 1967. Sprague attended the University of Cincinnati on a track scholarship. The scholarship lasted one semester and Sprague was forced to combine his studies with work and family. It was around this time that Sprague and Thrower would divorce. While in college, Sprague was encouraged by a friend to try modeling. His friend sent a photo of Sprague to Cult Studio in New York City, and he was invited to pose for them. During a four-day trip to New York, Sprague posed for his first nude photo shoot and was given the name Dakota, under which he was represented by the studio. After the shoot, Sprague returned to his schoolwork and job in Cincinnati. During that time, Colt sent his photo to their clients. The response was instant, and Sprague was asked to travel to California to do more modeling. In March 1970, Sprague arrived in California and did his second photo session when he was approached by a private collector to appear in a hardcore sex film. His co-star in that film was another bodybuilder and rising porn star, Jim Cassidy. Both men would go on to serve as a template for characters in the novel The Iron Game by David Carter. The author described Sprague as never feeling any guilt and someone who would take whatever position was necessary to ensure that he would end up in good shape financially. In 1972, Sprague made a notable appearance in the drag spoof of All About Eve, All About Alice, where he played the boyfriend of Mona and had a couple of full frontal nude scenes. It was rumored that Sprague worked as a hustler besides his work in porn. Sprague was said to have earned at least an additional $100,000 a year by turning tricks. Sprague later commented that he had made a great deal of money, but not in the way it had been portrayed. However it may have been, Sprague had a very profitable shadow life and amassed both a fan base and money. Around the same time, Sprague became a member of Gold's Gym in Venice, Los Angeles. Sprague had discovered Gold's Gym while vacationing in California in the summer of 1969. He would sneak in the train when the manager was out on lunch and was struck by the beauty of the gym's proximity to the ocean. He moved west the following summer and enrolled in Gold's Gym. By 1972, he had enough money in the bank to make a down payment on Gold's. On May 26, 1972, Sprague became the new owner of Gold's Gym in Venice, California. The then declining fitness club had less than 100 paying members. With the cooperation of wealthy friends and acquaintances, he also acquired a soundstage in Hollywood. Originally started with the idea of becoming a major influence in the field of pornography, the stage served mainly to produce gay porn. Sprague himself produced several all-male short films, which were later released as two feature films, Lodestar and California Superman, under his own company, Dakota Productions. Other bodybuilders had appeared in his scenes as well. Soon after he bought the gym, Sprague upped its cachet by sponsoring muscle contests that fetched big crowds, paying Waller and Schwarzenegger 50 bucks a piece to guest pose before judging. Bayoud by the turnout, Sprague began promoting Mr. America tournaments, which typically drew just a few hundred fans and paid no prize money for the winner. Sprague staged the event as a three-ring circus, leading a parade of half-clad bodybuilders riding bull elephants to the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium while brass bands played and a plane flew overhead trailing a banner trumpeting Mr. America. And of course, Gold's Gym. He sold 6,000 tickets and offered the top-tier patrons the chance to personally oil up a contestant. Sprague would earn a second fortune creating and staging shows, adding the Gold's Classic and Mr. California to the contest season. His master stroke, though, was hawking products that no gym owner before had thought to sell. He printed Gold's t-shirts and asked the crew to wear them during shoots. They sold faster than he could mail them. Suddenly, there were stories in LA papers about the swinging new trend of pumping iron and the celebrity sightings at that hotspot, Gold's, with stars like Clint Eastwood, Jane Fonda, and Muhammad Ali dropping into train. Fun fact, 
By now you know that Ken and Arnold were buddy-buddy during the golden era of Gold's Gym. In 1974, Sprague used some film footage of Arnold posing in one of his porn films. Arnold was rightfully angry and threatened to sue Sprague. Joe Weider stepped in to settle the issue. Sprague regretted using the footage and removed it. Unlike most porn ruined my life stories, Ken Sprague was a clever businessman. Besides owning Gold's Gym and associated porn studio, he was very involved with the wheelings and dealings around the early Mr. America competitions. There was some gay shaming trash talk, as you would expect from a bunch of bodybuilders, but overall, he seemed remarkably successful. After the modest beginnings following his purchase of the then declining fitness club, Sprague managed to make Gold's a household name. It was featured in the 1977 docudrama Pumping Iron. Sprague sold Gold's Gym in 1979 and later moved to Eugene, Oregon to focus on his family. He wrote and published several books about bodybuilding and worked as a teacher of math and science. In 1999, Sprague and his wife would move to Marietta, Georgia, where he worked as a teacher at Marietta High School until his retirement in 2010. You've been listening to Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory, as well as YouTube. You can reach me at Demystifying Gay Porn on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, Discord, Hive. And if you like what you're watching or listening to and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash Demystifying Gay Porn, where you can help support this podcast and YouTube channel so I can continue making content like the video or podcast you've just enjoyed. As always, don't forget to subscribe wherever you are, give this video or podcast a like, leave a comment anywhere, letting me know what else you'd like me to cover. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Cheers. <laughs>